The Aztecs by Nigel Davies Chapter 8 The Setting Sun Moctezuma was a man whose faith was severe rather than serene. Long before the first Spaniards set foot on his realm, evil omens had destroyed his fragile peace of mind. Already, ten years before Cortez's arrival, a comet was observed so bright as to turn night into day. Moctezuma immediately summoned to his presence every available augur, astrologer, and soothsayer. They merely told him that they themselves had seen no comet. Outraged by this unhelpful attitude, he told them that they had failed in their appointed task. They were thrown into cages and allowed to die of hunger. Nasahuapili of Texcoco, himself a necromancer of repute, did his best to reassure Moctezuma, telling him that there was nothing new about comets. This, however, was no small was small consolation, particularly as he, he had already warned Moctezuma on a previous occasion that he would never defeat the Tlaxcalans. He now foretold worse disasters. Calamities would follow which would dis destroy whole kingdoms. Nasahuapili knew he would never live to witness these happenings, and he could therefore afford to take a detached attitude. Moctezuma, however, wept copiously, lamenting that such evils had to come to pass in his time. O Lord of all creation, O Almighty gods in whose lands lies the power of life and death over mortals, how can you permit that after the passing of many powerful rulers it should fall to my lot to witness the terrible destruction of M Mexico, and that I should suffer the death of my wives and children, and live to see myself dispossessed of my great kingdoms and principalities and of my vassals, and of all that the Mexicans have conquered by their strong right arm and by the valor and spirit that lies within their breasts. What shall I do? Where shall I hide? Where can I see cover? Oh, if only I could now turn to, to stone or wood or some other form of matter before seeing that which I now await with such dread. Nasahuapili's death came quite soon after this. He had of late suffered greatly from Moctezuma's arrogance and from his determination to rule the empire single-handed. The latter's true feelings for his allies had been demonstrated when he had permitted the flower of the Texcocan army to be slaughtered by the Tlaxcalans, as he himself watched the battle from a hilltop, like Zerges at Salamis. Nasahuapili no longer possessed either the moral or physical force with which to counter Moctezuma, and he died in 1515. It is fascinating to speculate on what might have been the reactions of this extraordinary ruler to the Spanish invasion. To judge by his later years, he would hardly have been in the vanguard of the resistance movement and would have preferred dipl diplomacy to war. Perhaps, however, his wise counsels might have spared Moctezuma from the deepest humiliations. He, and even Cortes, might have acted differently if Nasahuapili had been at hand to advise and to moderate. In the course of his varied life, he had begot no less than 145 sons and daughters. Out of all this number, however, he had named no official heir, and accordingly left his, his kingdom in a state of confusion. Three legitimate sons survived to claim the throne of Texcoco, and from these Moctezuma sele sele selected Cacama, the son of his own sister. So completely was Texcoco now dominated by its former partner that Moctezuma was able to impose his own choice with l little difficulty. One of the three claimants, incensed by his rejection, offered armed resistance to his brother's election. According to his namesake and descendant, the chronicler Ishli Xochitl, this prince, later to play a key role in the conquest, as Cortes's favorite Texcocan, occupied certain of the northernmost territories controlled by Texcoco. Possibly, however, his loyal descendant exaggerates the effectiveness of this rebellion. Nevertheless, owing to Moctezuma's intransigence, the Spanish invasion found the people of his foremost ally divided and disillusioned. New horrors heaped themselves upon the head of Moctezuma, already hagridden before the first Spanish expedition reached the shores of the far-off peninsula of Yucatan. The accidental burning of the temple of the goddess Toki, owing to carelessness on the part of her priests, was taken as a fresh portent of doom. Moctezuma once more made a clean sweep of his astrologers, magicians, and sorcerers. This time, he had them killed, and also decreed that their homes should be sacked and their children reduced to, to slavery. Omens now followed thick and fast. On a windless day, the surface of the lagoon became as a cauldron, and waves of oceanic proportions lashed the shore. 
beating against the houses and shattering their foundations. Women's voices wailed in the night, telling of doom and destruction. Oddest of all, hunters brought to Moctezuma a bird the size of an eagle, with a round mirror in its head, gazing in t into this. He could see the stars, although it was day. He also saw something more sinister. And again, looking at the bird's head, he saw large numbers of people, drawn up in squadrons and advancing as for war. They appeared to be half men and half deer. His soothsayers were able to offer no explanation and he sought consolation in the company of his dwarves and hunchbacks. An even stranger episode now followed. Moctezuma actually decided at this point that he wished to flee the world and take refuge with Huemac, King of the Dead. His first and second contingent of messengers entered a deep cave and reached the presence of Huemac, who dismissed him rather scathingly, remarking that Moctezuma talked of the nether regions as if life went on there just as in the world in which he lived. Because the inhabitants of the underworld are no longer as they were in the world, but different in form and manner. Previously they had enjoyment, rest, and contentment. Now all is torment. This place is no delectable paradise, as the old refrain pretends, but a continual agony. Go tell Moctezuma that if he saw this place, he would flee from sheer terror and would even turn into stone. Not surprisingly, the envoys paid for their failure with their lives. However, a third mission found Huemac in a more receptive mood. He said that Moctezuma was condemned to suffer for his pride and cruelty and for his ruthless conduct towards his fellow men. Tell him, Moctezuma, that he should begin to do penance, that he should fast and give up his fine meals and that little by little he should give up his rule and privileges, the delicate roses, flowers, and carefully prepared perfumes. These things he must renounce and confine his diet to a few small loaves of meal and a spoonful of cooked beans, and that the water that he drinks must first be boiled, and that above all he must gradually separate himself from his women and not come to them. Moctezuma was overjoyed and readily sub submitted to this rigorous and meager diet. Eventually, Huemac actually consented to a rendezvous at a place in the middle of the lagoon. But finally, instead of coming personally to console the monarch, he sent a messenger, who merely upbraided him for his cowardice. Even if we may dismiss some of these omens as the figments of a frightened imagination, one of the strangest reports of all was based on more solid fact. A, a peasant came from afar on his own initiative to tell of a great mountain that he had seen moving in the sea. This seemed to Moctezuma to be the most far-fetched of all the tales he had heard, though to people accustomed only to canoes, it was a natural mode of describing the first Spanish ships to be sighted. This man, too, was in prison for his presumption. The report itself probably concerned a second Spanish expedition to the Mexican mainland. A previous force, led by Francisco Hernandez de, de Cordoba, set sail on February 8, 1517, and reached the coast of the peninsula of Yucatan at a place which they christened New Cairo, no doubt because the inhabitants were brown in color and non-Christian. The expedition was a failure and these first Spaniards actually allowed themselves to be defeated by the inhabitants of the region of Campeche. Half, half were killed and the rest seriously wounded. They retreated towards Florida, where Cordoba died of his wounds. The second expedition, under Juan de Grijalva, set sail from Cuba on May 1st, 1518, and reached the island of Cozumel off Yucatan in three days. When they landed on the mainland, they found a woman who spoke the language of the natives of Jamaica. She had been one of a fishing party driven thither by the two current years bef before. An interesting and positive example of the possibilities of pre-Columbian navigation. The Spaniards proceeded as far as an island at the name San Juan de Ulua, opposite the modern Veracruz, and then sailed further north as far as the river Panuco, catching on the way their first sight of the eternal snows of the Mexican volcanoes. They now know for sure that they were gazing at a vast country. The local inhabitants had repeated the words Culua and Mexico, pointing inland, hence the name Ulua, a misreading of Culua. Lacking interpreters, they had no idea what was meant nor were they aware that at times the people had taken them for gods. Moctezuma's stewards or tax-gatherers of that region were quick to send back reports of such astonishing visitors. 
They went to the Spanish ships in their canoes and kissed the prow of each boat, convinced that they were greeting returning deities. They exchanged rich mantles for some glass beads, which they took to Moctezuma, saying, Lord, we are worthy of death. Hear what we have seen and done. They related that they had seen gods in the midst of the sea. Moctezuma told them to to tell absolutely nothing of what had occurred. He informed his council and showed them the glass beads which he described as gems. He gave instructions that they should be most carefully preserved. None were to be lost on pain of death. The third Spanish expedition, consisting of 11 ships under Hernan Cortes, set out on February 10, 1519, ostensibly to find Grijalva, who had not returned. The force consisted of 508 men, apart from about 100 sailors. 32 were crossbowmen and 13 musketeers, armed with the arquebus. Also included for the first time were 16 horses, as well as some bronze cannon. When they reached the mainland near Cape Catoche, a supreme stroke of luck befell them. A letter, accompanied by a suitable ransom of beads, was sent to Geronimo de Aguilar and Vicente Guerrero, two Spaniards known to be living in slavery in Yucatan for some eight years, having been previously shipwrecked on that coast. Aguilar, who was overjoyed at receiving his message, managed to join Cortes, though he was in appearance and dress almost indistinguishable from an Indian. His companion, Guerrero, had told Aguilar that he preferred to stay where he was. He was by now looked on as a chief by his captor. Moreover, his face was tattooed and his ears were pierced, perhaps a unique example of a Spaniard virtually turned Indian. Aguilar was invaluable, for he spoke Yucatec Maya. Moreover, soon after this, the chiefs of Tabasco, a territory situated somewhat farther to the west, were to make Cortes a present of golden diadems and masks, together with five golden ducks. As an additional item to this lavish package, twenty women were added, who were promptly baptized. One of them was to be worth far more than her weight in gold, the famous Doña Marima, known to posterity as La Malinche. She was of royal descent, but owing to rivalries within her family had been reduced to a virtual state of slavery. She was to play an invaluable, if not commanding, role, not only as Cortes's interpreter, but as his advisor on native affairs. She knew both Putun and Nahuatl. Thus, by speaking in Spanish to Aguilar, who had translated this into Yucatec, which Marina in turn translated into Nahuatl, Cortes would be able to communicate with Moctezuma and his subjects. Prior to the acquisition of Doña Marina, the expedition had one of its many armed encounters with the native inhabitants of that coast. An engagement took place against a large Indian force, and a number of Spaniards were wounded. The sight of horses and riders, at this point still taken to be one and the same animal, was enough to make the Indians turn tail. They formally submitted, after being warned that if they did not render homage to the Emperor Charles the the Fifth, the guns would jump out and kill them. A suitable demonstration of cannon fire was staged to show how this could be achieved. His spies soon reported such unwanted happenings to Moctezuma. They had occurred in a region frequented by Aztec merchants although it did not form part of the empire. As the invasion came from the east, the ruler assumed that it was the god Getzquat who was returning since, according to legend, he had vanished thither after the fall of Tula and the Toltec Empire. As, as Cortes proceed, proceeded in a northwesterly direction along the coast, more reports were received. So far, no contact had been made with this expedition, but Moctezuma's observers climbed a tree and watched the Spaniards from the shore as they fished. Until quite late they continued to fish, and then entered a small canoe and reached the two enormous towers and climbed inside. There must have been about fifteen of them, with a kind of colored jackets, some blue, some brown, and some green, and some of a dirty color, rather ugly like our Ishtimat. Some had a pinkish hue, and on their heads they had colored pieces of cloth. These were scarlet caps, some very large and round like small maize cakes, which must have served as protection against the sun. Their flesh was very white, much more than ours, except that all wore a long beard and hair to their ears. Moctezuma now summoned five of his most trusted counselors and spoke as follows. Look, it hath been told how our lord Getzkoat has arrived. 
go and receive him and hear with much d diligence what he may say. This embassy was led by a very high official. It went provided with the most elaborate gifts. These included the traditional attire of Quetzalcoatl and of two other gods, Descatlipoca and Tlaloc. Clearly, Moctezuma was not altogether sure as to the true identity of Cortez. Part of the accoutrements of Quetzalcoatl consisted of a magnificent mask and shield. This mask was clapped into a tall and large diadem, full of rich feathers, long and beautiful, in such a way that by putting the diadem on one's head, the mask was also placed on the face. As a jewel, it bore a broad round medallion of gold. It was held by nine strings of precious stones, which fell over the neck and covered the shoulders and the entire breast. They also took a large shield bordered with precious stones with golden bands from top to bottom and with other bands of pearls that passed up and down over those of gold. And the spaces formed between these bands were like the meshes of a net, and contained little figures of toads. The envoys found Cortez in a place called Chicalango, to the south of the modern port of Veracruz. They boarded the ship and kissed the deck before Cortez. Upon this, they adorned the captain himself. They put upon him the turquoise mosaic serpent mask, with it went the Quetzal head fan, and with it went the green stone ear plugs in the form of serpents. And they clad him in the sleeveless jacket, they put the sleeveless jacket upon him, and they put the necklace upon him, the plated green stone neckband in the midst of which lay the golden disc. With this they bound him, on the small of his back, the mirror for the small of the back. Also with it they laid upon his back the cape named Tzitzili, and about half and about the calf of the leg they placed the green stone band with the golden shells. And they gave him and placed upon his arm the shield with lines of gold and shells crossing, on whose lower rim were spread Quetzal feathers and the Quetzal feather flag. And before him they set up city and sandals. Cortez, attired in such unusual fashion for a Spanish hid hidalgo, appeared quite composed and simply asked if there was more to follow. He then caused the cannon to be fired, and the whole deputation fell to the ground as if dead. The Spaniards picked them up and tried to, res and tried to restore their shattered spirits with, sp with, with Spanish wine. The unfamiliar potion made them drunk. Cortez then defied them to individual combat with his own men. They were in no state to face such an ordeal and politely refused, saying that their master had not sent them for this and would kill them if they consented. After that, they took to their leave and hurried back to Tenochtitlan, which they reached at night. Moctezuma was so ridden with anxiety that he could neither sleep nor eat, and passed the time moaning to himself. What will become of us? Captives were slain in the messenger's presence, and they were sprinkled with their blood before they told their tale. These ceremonies were performed because they had seen great things, and had seen the gods and spoken with them. Every imaginable detail was reported to Moctezuma. The Spaniards' white faces, the black countenance and curly hair of the of the Negroes, and even the ferocity of their dogs. Having heard all this, the monarch began to feel faint and was stricken with great anguish. The Spaniards' presence were treated with all the respect due to sacred relics. The food was put into a beautiful blue jar and taken to the main temple, where it was placed in the round stone normally used to receive human hearts, Guashikali. Afterwards, the gifts were taken to Tula and buried in the temple of Quetzcoatl after many quails had been sacrificed in their honor. Moctezuma now sent a further mission to Cortez, which found him disembarked near the present-day Veracruz. Ver the ruler was plainly in two minds about his supposedly divine visitors, since he now sent in, ad in addition sorcerers whose spells might secure their death or departure, a treatment surely not normally to be m meted out to gods. Their skills were naturally of no avail. Meanwhile, Cortez had also encountered Moctezuma's stewards or tax gatherers stationed in this region. They actually dined with him and were treated to another exhibition of cannon fire. One of the two, called Tendil, had Cortez and his forces painted down to the last de detail, including the ships, the horses, and even the, the two greyhounds. Coincidences, sometimes almost rid ridiculous, continued to confound Moctezuma. Tendil had sent him a rusty Spanish helmet, rather resembling the one that had been that had reputedly been consigned by Huitzilopochtli to his chosen people. Cortez astutely took advantage of this 
by suggesting that the helmet be returned to him, filled with gold dust. Confronted with this relic, and the news every day more alarming, Moctezuma again thought of flight to the nether regions. By now he had become totally desperate, though moments of panic were interspersed with moods of resignation. He did no more than simply await them, the Spaniards. He did no more than to resolve it in his heart and to resign himself. Finally, he dominated his heart, withdrew into himself, and remained disposed to see and admire whatever might come to pass. Tendil now returned to Cortez, bringing the helmet duly filled with gold as well as an even more lavish assortment of gifts. They brought twenty ducks made of gold, very natural looking, and other beautifully cast pieces representing dogs of the kind that they, they own, tigers, lions, and, and monkeys. They had, they had also brought ten necklaces of the finest workmanship, a dozen arrows with a bow and its string, and two staffs, like those of justice, five palms long, all of the finest gold. At the same time, Moctezuma, having seen pictures of his visitors, adapted an, adopted an odd ruse. He sent with Tendil a chieftain called Quintaborm, who bore a striking resemblance to Cortez, and whom the Spaniards called the other Cortez. He vainly hoped to achieve some result through magic by impersonation. He had by now received Cortez's requests to visit him. In, re in reply, he insisted that this would be highly inconvenient and begged the Spaniards to stay where they were. Tendo, one of Moctezuma's subjects to attend divine worship, expressed astonishment that the Spaniards could humble themselves before a mere piece of wood. For this, he was treated to a homily by the Mercedarian friar, who probably did little but increase his bewilderment. Moctezuma's moods were highly volatile. He tended to blow hot and cold towards the invaders, and even Cortez himself, in their voluminous exchange of messages, complained of the changing attitudes of the Mexican monarch. He simply could not make up his mind as to the identity of the Spaniards, and at one moment of doubt as to the divine nature, he had the curious idea of capturing them and using them for the procreation of future sacrificial victims. Moctezuma had managed to impose a degree of absolutism, seldom if ever witnessed before in, in ancient Mexico. His conduct tended towards the capriciousness of the all-powerful. It was unheard of that any should oppose his divine will, let alone a small band of interlopers into his realm. He thus now alternated between de dejection and anger. In this, he was further confused by divided councils in Tenochtitlan and confounded by the opposition of the, re of the religious hierarchy to a policy of conciliation. As a result of his supreme uncertainty, the treatment accorded to the Spaniards notably, noticeably deteriorated as the monarch starts turned from appeasement towards confrontation. One morning they awoke to find that the Indians who served them had simply disappeared. At this point, an entirely new factor came into play which was to have far-reaching consequences. One day on the beach, Cortez's men encountered five Indians who, though nominally subject to the empire, were plainly hostile to its rulers. They were Totonacs, and their master was the ruler of Sempoala, a prosperous town a little farther to the north. Having now made the momentous discovery that not all of Moctezuma's subjects were, lo were loyal, Cortez decided to move into the territory of his new acquaintances. On his way, he passed the present site of Veracruz. The Via Rica de Veracruz, which he himself founded, was on a small anchorage near Geoitzlan. This settlement did not last for long. It was first transferred to a locality a few miles to the south, still known as Via Rica. Later, it was again moved to the present site of Veracruz, opposite the island of San Juan de Ulua. The town of Sempoala filled the Spaniards with admiration. As we entered the town, and saw how much larger it was than any we had yet come across, we were stricken with admiration. The vegetation was so luxuriant, and the streets were so filled with men and women who had come to see us, that we thanked God for having discovered such country. They were received by the ruler who, for his ample proportions, has gone down to history as the fat chief. He complained at length to Cortez of the treatment of his lord and master, Moctezuma one of his most burning grievances being that the letter had taken away all his jewelry. As a consolation for his loss, Cortez presented him with some Spanish clothing. In reading of Cortez's amiable conversations with this potentate, it is worth recalling that they must have had their tedious side. 
Cortez's words were first put into Yucatec Maya by Aguilar. By Doña Marina, they were then translated into Nahuatl, and subsequently by the Fat Chiefs' interpreters from Nahuatl to Totona. The Spaniards next proceeded to Giawitzlan, which they found deserted. However, on the day following their arrival, they were, greedy, they were greeted by fifteen richly clad Indians, who begged to be excused for not having received them previously. They had been too frightened of the horses. Shortly thereafter, Cortes was to have his first glimpse of the Mexican imperial administration. While we were talking, the chiefs were informed that five Mexicans were arriving. They lost color, trembled with fear, and hurried away to receive the newcomers. A room was decorated with branches and food was prepared, including plenty of cocoa, which is their principal drink. The five Indians passed where we were, as the houses of the chiefs were there, but they didn't speak to Cortez or to any of the rest of us and went on with an insolent and presumptuous manner. They wore richly embroidered robes and breech cloths, and their hair glistened and was so dressed that it seemed to be part of their heads. Each bore a crooked staff and carried roses. While they sniffed these, servants followed, keeping away mosquitoes. They were accompanied by the principal people of the Totonac towns, who did not leave them until the Mexicans had been shown to apartments and had eaten. These were the Calpixques, or tax gatherers, who represented the imperial power in the provinces and supervised the payment of tribute by the many peoples whom the Aztecs had subjected by conquest. To the utter astonishment of the chiefs, Cortes ordered that the five men should be seized. He actually prompted the terrified Totonacs to carry out these orders themselves. Having done so, they were then carried away by their boldness and were eager to sacrifice the Mexicans. Cortes, exercising his customary astuteness, held them back. He went so far as to release two of the tax gatherers, whom he sent back to Moctezuma. When the Totonacs remonstrated at his leniency, he cast the remaining three into chains and took them on board one of his ships. Thereupon, they were again released and kindly treated. The imprisonment of the tax gatherers was a fundamental step, marking the parting of the ways. The Totonacs now became a committed to a defensive alliance with the Spaniards as the only means of saving themselves from a hideous vengeance. For the Aztecs, the Spaniards were no longer mere intruders, but hostile invaders who had suborned their subjects into an area vital to the economy of the whole empire, which was now accordingly a victim of enemy attack. From his handling of this and many other situations, it became clear that in Cortez's mind, the Spaniards had a leader of rare genius. It was Moctezuma's ill luck to be confronted by a leader possessing not only the typical conquistador's virtues of physical courage and military skill, but in addition displaying a talent for diplomacy and a depth of vision and human understanding, rarely if ever to be encountered among the rough hewn settlers who had poured into the islands of the Spanish Indies. Moctezuma, his empire now faced with incipient disintegration, sent an even grander delegation, including one of his own nephews and one of his inner council of four, complaining bitterly of Cortez's attitude and accusing him of inciting his subjects to rebellion, perhaps a rather forthright manner in which to address a god. He could not understand why Cortez remained in the house of such traitors. Cortez's cause had been greatly forwarded by divisions now revealing themselves within the ranks of his opponents. His ability to find friends as well as enemies among the natives of Mexico was fundamental to his success, but just as the Spanish leader was aided by his gift for pol political intrigue, he was equally handicapped by an almost fanatical impetuosity in manners concerning his faith. On several occasions, this tendency was to impede the successful conclusion of his venture. At this point, a religious debate had arisen between the Spaniards and the Sempoalans. The former had, meanwhile, returned to Sempoala, where the fat chief had presented them with some women. Cortes thanked them, but insisted that they could not accept such human chattels until they became Christians, adding that it was high time that all the Sempoalans should give up their cherished idols. The leaders and priests gave the answer that the Spaniards were repeatedly to hear until the moment when they were in a position to enforce Christianity. Their own gods gave them health and sustenance, and they would therefore resist such a preposterous proposition to the last. Meanwhile, their human sacrifices continued uninterrupted. Cortes, deeply incensed, sent fifty of his men to smash the sacred images of the Sempoalan gods. The words were no sooner said than fifty of us soldiers were up and smashing the idols. Some were like horrible dragons as large as calves, 
Others were half men and half dog of evil appearance. When they saw them this way, in pieces, the chiefs and priests wept and closed their eyes and begged for pardon, willing that it wasn't their fault that we had broken them. A church was now set up at the top of the temple, and four priests, with their matted hair now shorn and dressed in white cloaks, were appointed to serve as acolytes. This was one of the last acts of Cortes before undertaking the arduous march inland. Like the imprisonment of the stewards, it was a decisive step. From now on, not only the Aztec state, but the very church was under Spanish assault. It was from this quarter that the bitterest opposition was to be encountered. As will later be seen, a similar gesture repeated at an unfortunate moment nearly cost Cortes all his triumphs. In many ways, he and Moctezuma were not unlike. Both were able generals and astute politicians with a flair for ambiguous diplomatic exchanges. Both were hard-headed realists and both were re religious fanatics. Cortes, however, was able to pursue a more consistent course. Moctezuma's convictions, while deep-seated, were swayed by considerations of magic and therefore liable to sudden change of direction. Cortes, on the other hand, was moved by a single-minded and wholly genuine determination to win the Indians to his faith. In both protagonists, faults as well as merits were writ large. Cortes's lust for gold came second only to his zeal for the spread of Catholic Christianity. But it was his virtues rather than his vices that were to bring trouble upon his head. While one day he could have a Spanish soldier hang for stealing two turkeys, so anxious was he to appear just to the natives. He could on other occasions go out of his way to provoke opposition by giving open vent to his horror of the Mexican gods, who for him were pure devils. While Moctezuma, while Moctezuma vacillated, uncertain as to the very nature of his adversary, Cortez's mind was firmly made up. Come what might, he would go to Tenochtitlan and imprison Moctezuma. On July 10th, before he set out, he had already written this effect to Charles V. At the same time, he sent to the emperor a dazzling array of gifts. As a virtual rebel from the authority of Diego Vasquez, governor of Cuba, he could only hope to win the favor of the ever penurious Charles by supplies of bullion. Accordingly, Cortez was resolute while Moctezuma wavered. However, on one point, at least, the latter's mind was also quite clear. Whether human or, or divine, everything must be done to stop Cortes from entering his capital. With this in view, an avalanche of messengers descended upon the Spaniards as they advanced. In the middle of August 1519, Moctezuma's intelligence service warned him that Cortes was heading inland. He had spent some five months on the coast, and now there was only one direction in which he could move, forward to Tenochtitlan in a direct confrontation with Moctezuma. After the first day's march, he was reported to have reached Jalapa, capital of the modern state of Veracruz. The following march brought the Spaniards up to the high plateau, and from now on they were to proceed through semi-desert country, seared by freezing winds. The contrast with the fertile and balmy coastlands was extreme. Ever more alarming reports released Tenochtitlan as the invading force gradually came nearer, greeted on their way in many towns subject to the empire. At one stopping place, Zacatlan, today Zaula, the local ruler, Olintet, tried to impress upon Cortes the impregnability of Tenochtitlan and the might of Moctezuma. His people were even more impressed by the Spaniards, by whose appearance they were utterly astonished. On, the, on this occasion, it was the greyhounds which caused the greatest sensation. One dog barked much in the night, and the inhabitants inquired of Cortes's Indian porters if they were lions or tigers. They were informed that the Spaniards took these animals along with them to kill anything that bothered them. Equally, the horses could run like deer and catch anything they wished. The rulers of Tlaxcala were officially informed of the coming of the Spaniards by dispatch of a letter, which they naturally were unable to read. This went accompanied with the gift of a crimson taffeta hat, a sword, and a crossbow. It will be recalled that it was an ancient Mexican custom to send arms to prospective adversaries. Cortez's first sight of the frontiers of Tlaxcala was a formidable wall. The Tlaxcalan reaction was not unlike that of the Mexicans. The leaders disagreed as to how to, to treat the invader. Paper charms were first tried. When they proved ineffective, armed resistance was offered, and in two pitched battles the tiny Spanish force scattered a vast horde of Tlaxcalans. One Spaniard was killed and was buried secretly, in order not to dispel any persisting notions as to their divine nature. After an unsuccessful night attack, 
The Tlaxcalan priests had affirmed that the enemy lost all their strength in the dark. The Tlaxcalans made their peace. For the Spaniards, a relief from hostilities was most welcome. Many were, were wounded or sick after their continuous exertions. Their erstwhile adversaries now offered a hospitality which was warm-hearted but lacking in lavish presence. They had little to, to give, since Moctezuma's blockade had reduced their standard of living and deprived them of luxury imports. However, they provided as best as they could for Cortez's force. At first, ignorant of the fact that the horses were ir irrational beasts, they offered them the same fare as to their masters, turkeys, maize, cakes, and meat. The Aztecs now knew that a new and decisive step had been taken towards the destruction of their empire. The new adversary from across the sea had joined forces with the old enemy from within, and the continuous state of war prevailing on the high plateau between the empire and the indomitable Tlaxcalans had proven of great assistance to Cortes. Moctezuma was surely aghast when his spies told him of the easy Spanish triumphs over an army which had resisted his combined levies. His gifts now grew greater and his messages more frantic. He politely congratulated Cortes on his victory over his own enemies. At the same time, he implored him not to come to Tenochtitlan, warning him that the way was rough and, st and sterile. He would even pay tribute to the Spanish emperor if he would only agree not to proceed farther. What Moctezuma totally failed to understand was that gifts of gold only hardened the invader's resolve to reach the front head of such bounty. Moreover, Cortes was a man who positively thrived on opposition. The greater the obstacles placed in his way, the stronger his determination to reach his goal. Quite apart from any political or moral consequences of victory over Tlaxcala, the, the military significance was immeasurable. It was now demonstrated beyond doubt that in the open field a few Spaniards could make mincemeat of any Indian host, however vast. This was to be proved time and again in many a battle, whether in Mexico or later in Peru. At the outset, the shot caused by unfamiliar arms was clearly stunning. Even in subsequent encounters, horses, guns, and arquebuses were often used to good effect. It should, however, be borne in mind that later, at the very nadir of their fortunes, the Spaniards crushed the Aztecs out of Tuma when they had lost all their artillery and had only 23 debilitated horses. Even during part of the final operation against the Nochtitlan, cavalry could not be used. In addition, it may be recalled that only 13 of the original force were armed with arquebus, at the same time still a rather clumsy weapon, particularly in wet weather. The Spanish ability to, to defeat Indians was probably due more to their superiority in conventional weapons. The crossbow completely outmatched the simpler Indian bow, though it may be interesting to reveal that the crossbow itself, a weapon that was slow to load, had been proven, had been proved inferior to the Welsh longbow at the Battle of, of Cressy 173 years before the conquest. Of even greater significance, however, was the sword, the arm of the great majority of the Spanish fighting force, which was vastly superior to the Indian weapon, Macguahuitl, a kind of wooden club studded with points of obsidian. The, the latter had to be lifted to inflict a blow, whereas the Spaniards could dispatch Indian after Indian with lightning sword thrusts before they could strike back with, with their more unwieldy arm. Notwithstanding continuous Spanish insistence on the bravery of the Indians, their ordinary weapons appeared to have been rather ineffective by European standards. One is continually struck by the high proportion of wounded among the Spanish as compared with the relatively few who were killed in the open field. The Mexican bow and arrows seem more able to wound than to kill the invader, although he took to using native cotton armor. One is also led to doubt the efficacy of the Indian bow, from the constant Spanish references to the toll taken by slings and stones. Hardly a very advanced weapon, but one which they seem to have feared more than Indian arrows. Cortez himself mentions stones as among the more effective native arms, which implies that their other weapons were not over-efficient. Yet another factor, decisive but hard to assess, requires to be taken into account. Spanish superiority in tactics and morale. Bernal Diaz, after conceding that they defeated the Tlaxcalans principally by their sword play, at a moment when they also had guns and horses, relates that the Indians were often badly led. They tended to bunch together, and their knowledge of tactics was poor. 
Initially, they were hopelessly inhibited by their obsession with dragging away their enemies alive as sacrificial victims, surely a most complicated maneuver in the heat of battle. Twice, they could surely have killed Cortez himself and thus almost have ended the war if they had not been so intent on capturing him alive. Moreover, Indian morale in battle was fragile and depended upon success. At the first reverse, they would lose courage, whereas the dogged Spaniards positively thrived on adversity. The Indians were certainly very brave fighters, but they were pitted against the greatest soldiers of the age. For a century and a half, no Spanish army was ever defeated in a pitched battle. Moreover, they were attempting to fight such a formidable adversary by engaging in a conflict that was only half war and half a process governed by ritual and magic. They simply did not understand the meaning of total war as it was conducted in 16th century Europe. This is exceedingly well illustrated in their failure to mount any truly effective resistance to Cortez's evacuation of Tenochtitlan and the later departure from Tacuba. The Spaniards, by contrast, were never to be caught off their guard, trained as they were for a quite different kind of war. In Tenochtitlan, they were always armed and never even removed their shoes. As part of their different approach to battle, the Spaniards were more resourceful than their adversaries. Cortez's forces were able to use the native type of lance to good effect. The Mexicans, however, when they captured a number of Spanish swords, would not learn to use them in the, pro in the proper way. The Inca, by contrast, did try to use arquebuses in their great rebellion. The psychological superiority of the Spaniards in the battlefield was probably more decisive than any other factor, such as unknown weapons or notions of Spanish divinity. Face to face, the Indians were simply not a match for the Spaniards, how however exigeous their force. It was only later, by bombarding them from the rooftops of Tenochtitlan, or from above the deep ravines, ravines ex excuse me, in Peru, that the Indians were able to achieve a measure of success. Meanwhile, Cor as Cortes cemented his alliance with the Tlaxcalans, the debate continued in Tenochtitlan as to whether to welcome the, inv the invader or fight. The leading pr protagonist of resistance was Quitlawak, Moctezuma's brother, who was later to succeed him for a brief interval as, as ruler. Those who favored the admission of the Spaniards into the capital were by no means necessarily partisans of appeasement. To many, it seemed easier to kill them inside the city than outside. Such possibilities appeared particularly to the religious hierarchy. Councils were thus totally divided, and the poor Moctezuma could secure no firm advice. Cortes was by now in a most advantageous position. By his military and diplomatic successes, he had the Mexicans and the Tlaxcalans competing for his favors. For, for once, Moctezuma instructed his messengers to beg Cortes to come to Tenochtitlan, so anxious was he to get him out of the clutches of the hated Tlaxcalans. Moctezuma's ambassadors went so far as to indulge in a form of slanging match with the leading Tlaxcalans in Cortes's presence. The Spaniards had meanwhile proceeded to neighboring Cholula, where they were well received. Cortes made one of his rather ineffective speeches, enjoined the people to renounce their, their gods. But in Cholula, he did not limit himself to mere exhortations. His men proceeded to massacre a great number of Cholulans in the main court of their temple. This afforded another proof of the poor protection offered by their ancient gods. The pretext for the killing originated in an old wives' tale. An aged woman told Doña Marina of a conspiracy instigated by Moctezuma to surprise and kill the Spaniards. Whether such a plot ever existed remains an open question. It must, however, be admitted that it would have been consistent with Moctezuma's behavior to instigate orders, whom he could later dis disown, to oppose the Spaniards, just as Cortes at times urged on others into committing hostile acts against Moctezuma. He, of course, denied all complicity with the Cholulans, and exchanges between him and Cortes continued to be outwardly fr friendly, how, how, however much each wished to be rid of the other. These new happenings were faithfully reported to Moctezuma, who naturally was horror-struck that a, that a massacre should have been perpetrated in the sacred city of Cholula, in the precinct of the temple of Quetzalcoatl, the very god whom Cortes had been held to personify. All the road was filled with messengers going in both directions, and all the people here in Mexico and in the regions from whence the Spaniards were coming went about very alarmed and disturbed. It was as if the very earth was moving, and all were filled with fear and amazement. 
and after the massacre in Cholula, the Spaniards were coming with their Indian friends, making much clamor and throwing up clouds of dust. Their arms shone from afar and caused great fear among those who observed them. At the same time, the greyhounds that they took with them inspired great terror, for they were large, with their mouths open, their tongues hanging out. As they panted, they petrified all that saw them. The menace drew nearer and nearer as the Spanish force advanced, undeterred by further messengers, saying that there was no road or no food. The tension in the Aztec capital mounted as the Spaniards proceeded between the great volcanoes through what is still known as the Paso de Cortes. As they passed the summit, yet another large and heavily laden embassy reached them, led by a prince who resembled Moctezuma and actually pretended that he was the ruler in person. The Tlaxcalans were quick to uncover this fatal rose, and the Spaniards addressed him in, a, in rather deprecating terms. Do you think you can deceive us? Do you take us for imbeciles? You cannot fool us, and whatever he may do, Moctezuma cannot hide himself. Though he might be a bird, or he might descend below the earth, see him we must, and hear what he has to say. A further incident ensued, also verging on the ludicrous. Another deputation of sorcerers and magicians on their way to cast spells on Cortez met an Indian who appeared to be very drunk. By now, they were ready to believe anything, and succeeded in convincing themselves that the seemingly inebriated peasant was the god Tezcatlipoca in person. To a surprise and embarrassment, they proceeded to set up an, an altar and prostrate themselves before him. The last ambassador to reach Cortez as he drew near Tenochtitlan was Moctezuma's nephew, the, the ruler of Texcoco. Let us return to Moctezuma, who had heard Cortez's reply, and then sent us a nephew named Gacamatzin, lord of Texcoco, to, to welcome us. He arrived in a litter embroidered with green feathers, with much silver work and many rich stones set in the finest gold. Eight chiefs bore it all of whom they said were lords of their towns. The people of the thickly populated valley of Mexico were all agog at the approach of the exotic intruders. To them, too, the scene was unfamiliar and fantastic as they came to Iztapalapa, guarding one of the main causeways over the lagoon leading to, Ten to Tenochtitlan. When we saw so many cities and villages built both on the water and on dry land and this straight level causeway, we couldn't restrain our admiration. It was like the enchantments in the book of Amadis. Because of the high towers, guez, and other buildings, all of masonry, which rose from the water, some of our soldiers asked if what we saw was not a dream. The sheer beauty of the scene, as, surveyed, as they surveyed the lakefront, studded wood cities, did not cause the Spaniards to forget for one moment the perils which beset them. Many even feared a trap it was self-evident that the drawbridges which they now passed could be removed behind them. The climax was now to be reached, and it is Bernal Diaz who gives the best description of the scene. When we came close to Mexico, at a place where there were other smaller towns, Moctezuma descended from his litter while these great chiefs supported him with their arms beneath a marvelously rich canopy of green feathers, worked with gold and silver, pearls and green stones, which hung from a kind of border that was wonderful to see. He was richly dressed and wore shoes like sandals, with soles of gold covered with precious stones. The four chiefs who supported him were also richly dressed in clothes that had been apparently been held ready for them on the road, for they had not worn them when they received us. There were four other chiefs who carried the canopy and many other lords who walked before the great Moctezuma sweeping the ground where he would pass and putting down mats so that he would not have to walk on the ground. None of these lords thought of looking in his face. All of them kept their eyes down with great reverence. When Cortez saw the great Moctezuma approaching, he jumped from his horse and they showed great respect toward each other. Then Cortez gave him a necklace he had ready to hand, made of glass stones that I have already called margar margaritas, which have in them many designs in a variety of colors. They were strung on a golden cord and sweetly scented with musk. He placed it around Moctezuma's neck and was going to embrace him. When the princes accompanying him caught Cortez by the arm so that he could not do so, for they thought it an indignity. Moctezuma greeted Cortez with the following words. Our Lord, you have wearied yourself. You have made yourself tired. Now you have reached your own land. 
you have arrived at your city, Mexico. Here you have come to sit upon your throne and seat. Oh, for a brief span, those who have already departed, your substitutes have kept and guarded it. The lords and kings, Itzkoat, the elder Moctezuma, Ashayakat, Tisak, Awitzot. Oh, for what a short time they protected and guarded the city of Mexico on your behalf. Beneath your frame and under your protection, the common people are now placed. No, I am not dreaming, nor am I rising heavy with sleep. I am not seeing in dreams, nor seeing visions. I have in truth seen you, and have now set eyes upon your face. Five or ten days ago I was in anguish. My gaze was fixed toward the region of mystery, and you have come between mists and clouds. This is what was told to us by those kings who ruled and governed your city. That you had to install yourself in your seat and throne, that you had to come hither. And now it has come to pass, now you have arrived, with much fatigue and toil. Come to our land, come and repose. Take possession of your royal abodes. Give comfort to your body. Come to your land, O lords. The, Sp the Spaniards were taken and settled in the spacious house that had been the place of Moctezuma's father, Ashayakat. On their arrival, they fired two cannon shots, and with the noise and smoke, all the Indians that were there stood as if they were mad and walked as if drunk. They began to go in all directions in great fear, and both those present and those farther away were stricken with mortal dread. Their consternation had now reached a fever pitch. All this was as if they had eaten hallucinating mushrooms or had seen some dreadful vision. All was dominated by terror, as if all had lost heart. And when night fell, the alarm was so intense, and all were so filled with fear that it made them unable to sleep. In the end, anything becomes familiar, however terrifying it may seem at first sight. Initially, no one dared to approach the Spaniards. However, at the assistance of Doña Marina, provisions were brought by tremulous Indians, who fled as soon as they had delivered their charge. Meeting again with Moctezuma, Cortes gave his usually homily about Christian faith and virtues, but met with an unqualified rebuff. Moctezuma's answer was unequivocal. Señor Malinche, I have understood what you have said to my servants about these gods and the cross, and the other things you have spoken about in the towns through which you passed. We have not answered any of it, for here we have always worshipped our own gods and hold them to be good, so yours must be. For the present, do not talk about them any more. Probably Cortez's words have been somewhat confused by the difficulties of interpretation, and this version of the Christian religion may not have appeared to Moctezuma as so different from his own beliefs. Talk of three gods in one, of a god born by immaculate conception, and of the sacrifice of the god himself would not have seemed totally unfamiliar. Mention of the symbolic eating of the god's flesh probably seems suggestive of the limbs of captives, personifying Huitzilopochtli, ritually consumed at his table. After this abortive beginning, a further exchange on the subject of religion took place. Moctezuma then took Cortes and some of the Spaniards to see the great market and temple of Tlatelolco, of which a description has already been given. After climbing to the top of the temple, Cortes again made disparaging remarks about the gods, whose images he now saw. Moctezuma once more replied that these were the deities who gave them health and good crops. He insisted that Cortes should say no more of them. Bernal Diaz, who was present, describes a view from the lofty temple, from which all the other lakeside cities and the causeways leading to them could be seen. We saw the fresh water which came from Chapultepec, which supplied the city, and the bridges on the three causeways built at certain intervals so the water could go from one part of the lake to another, and a multitude of canoes, some arriving with provisions and others leaving with merchandise. We saw that every house in this great city and the others built on the water could be reached only by wooden drawbridges or by canoes. We saw temples built like towers and fortresses in these cities, all whitewashed. It was a sight to see. We could look down on the flat roofed houses and the other little towers and temples like fortresses along the causeways. The immediate course of events was to resolve around the peculiar relationship established between Cortes and Moctezuma, about which so much has already been written. Two questions have been repeatedly asked. Why did Moctezuma ever admit the Spaniards to Tenochtitlan without a fight? And secondly, why did he then allow them to take him prisoner? As Senor Madriaga and others have constantly and rightly emphasized, in Cortes and Moctezuma, two worlds met and two concepts totally alien to one another. 
In spite of certain similarities of character and a tendency on the part of both men to conceal hostile intentions beneath the mask of suavity, and there were fundamental differences. Cortez's faith was not necessarily deeper or more genuine than, than Moctezuma's, as has been suggested, but then had the advantage of establishing an immutable goal, the conversion of the heathens at all cost. In this, he never wavered. On the other hand, Moctezuma had no such clear objectives, and as far as we know, never even tried to convert Cortez to his own beliefs. The Mexican ruler, swayed by day-to-day -day prophecies and portents, was to act upon considerations of the immediate expediency and alternated between wrath and resignation. Moctezuma's volatility of mind was made manifest in his changing views as to the identity of the Spaniards. Play has been made in innumerable accounts of Moctezuma's conviction that Cortez was the god Quetzalcoatl, as the only possible way of accounting for his seemingly cowardly and submissive attitude. Modern writers have continually placed emphasis on the suggestion that Cortez was taken for the bearded white god Quetzalcoatl, who was destined to return from the east in the year 1 Reed, 1519. Now, in the first place, it has to be unequivocally stated that the story of the bearded white Quetzalcoatl is a purely post-conquest invention, and native pictorial codices give absolutely no support to such assertions. Quetzalcoatl often wears a duck-billed mask as a god of wind. When depicted without this, he either has a completely black face, or sometimes black but with a vertical yellow stripe. It is true that sometimes the deity is shown wearing a beard, but so are also are many of the older Mexican gods. As a creator god, he naturally ranks among these. So much for the bearded white god. Even the notion of a deep-seated and ancient legend that Quetzalcoatl would return from the east in the year one read rests on somewhat slender foundations. This is also a story that comes to us from his from Hispanized chroniclers, not from earlier na native accounts, and their references to the subject are moreover rather vague. Fray Motolinia, writing between 1530 and 1546, tells of a god of the wind called Quetzalcoatl, who came from Tula and, would and who would one day return. Fray Mendieta, writing at the end of the century, repeats this, the same tale but includes the patently inaccurate detail that Quetzalcoatl was a white and bearded deity. Ava Ishli Sojit, writing even later, says much the same, but adds the refinement that he would return in the year one read. From such accounts, the legend of the return of Quetzalcoatl apparently later gained substance and finally became a commonplace to be repeated by one commenter after another. One, however, we turn to native sources written in Nahuatl, we find something quite distinct. These versions are highly poetic in their language in describing the flight of Quetzalcoatl, but quite different. In such accounts, Quetzalcoatl, who in one personification was a great r ruler of the Toltecs, abandoned Tula and passed by Cholula. He then went to the Red and Black Land, to the Tlantlapatlan, normally taken as the Maya land, red and black being the colors of the codices, and therefore connected with learning. From thence, he departed in the year one read, the year of his birth. According to some versions, he went away in a boat, and to others, was consumed by fire and transformed into the morning star. In such form, he would have already f returned frequently, long before the arrival of Cortez, but in these native accounts there is no mention of any kind of return of Quetzalcoatl, in the year one read or any other year, except for his symbolic return as the morning star. According to a poem on the flight of Quetzalcoatl, it is in the red land, the place where you are awaited, only there is the land of your dreams. Nakshit Doblitzing, another name for this Getzkoat, never will your name perish, but for you your vassals shall weep. From the annals of Quatitlan, they say that in the year one reed, having arrived at the heavenly shore of the divine water, i.e. the sea, he stopped, wept, shrugged his shoulders, arranged his insignia of feathers in his green mask. And then he adorned himself, and lighted the fire, and was burnt. The account goes on to say that he became the morning star and reappeared on the eighth day. According to the version given to Sahagun by his native informants and transcribed in Nahuatl, after much weeping and many adventures, Getzkoat came to the sea coast. And when he had done these things, he went to reach the sea coast. Thereupon he fashioned a raft of serpents. When he had arranged the raft, there he placed himself as if it were his boat. Then he set across the sea. 
No one knows how he came to arrive there in Tlapalan. This digression may serve to cast doubts upon the existence of any deep-seated uncertainty that Cortez was the returning Getzkoat. It appears that what really happened is that Moctezuma, in his anguish, deduced that because Getzkoat had disappeared in the east, any strange being coming from that quarter must ipso facto be that deity. The chronicler Tesosomoc says exactly this. Moctezuma tells some of his messengers of how Getzkoat had gone away to the east and adds that now he must have come back to enjoy what is his. It must indeed be conceded that Moctezuma seems to have conceived of Cortes at certain moments as a kind of deity, even if we do not place too literal an interpretation on his welcoming address, an occasion on which it would be normal to flatter. That he was not originally sure of the nature of the returning deity is confirmed by his dispatch to Cortes, not only of the regalia of Quetzalcoatl, but also that of two other gods. Moreover, apart from the doubts as to the existence of a legend of Quetzalcoatl's return in the year one read, it has to be remembered that the first two Spanish expeditions, of which Moctezuma was fully involved, arrived in previous years. Grijalva was also taken for Quetzalcoatl. Although the Tlaxcalans were his enemies, Moctezuma was accurately informed of what occurred on their side of the mountains. Now, it seems highly probable that the Tlaxcalans soon became aware that Cortes and the Spaniards were only too human. The Tlaxcalan priests actually informed their leaders that the, Spanish were, that, the, that the Spaniards were men because they ate turkeys, dogs, and maize cakes, and not the hearts of victims. Cortes himself went out of his way to tell them that he was a man of flesh and blood. Equally, the Spanish gold hunger, apparent from the moment of landing, must have helped to destroy the myth. Well before the Spaniards entered Tenochtitlan, native accounts tell of their hysterical reactions when opportunities occurred to acquire the precious metal. Moreover, it would have indeed been hard to explain how Cortes could have profaned the holy city of Cholula with a bloody massacre if he himself represented that deity. What occurred there was clearly regarded as a defeat for Quetzalcoatl, who had not protected his chosen people. Clearly, a god could not defeat himself. If any doubts remained in Moctezuma's mind, they were surely dispelled by his first conversation with Cortes. On this occasion, he actually told the latter that he could now see that they were men of bone and flesh. It is much more feasible that he continued to think of Charles V, described to him as an all-powerful and almost legendary figure, ruling a vast realm beyond the ocean, as a kind of deity. Cortes had mentioned God and Charles V to Moctezuma almost in the same breath, asking him to offer his obedience to these two lords. Such a misconception might go far to explain Moctezuma's extreme readiness to submit his realm to Charles V at Cortes' bidding. Had Moctezuma been aware that in the very year of 1520, the seemingly godlike Charles V was in such deep trouble with his own subjects in Spain that such important cities as Toledo and Salamanca had temporarily thrown off his authority, he would have been even more greatly confused. The, the Getzkoat legend is surely, therefore, itself in itself inadequate to explain Moctezuma's ap apparently pusillanimous attitude, and additional motives must be sought. Whether human or divine, he was undoubtedly afraid of the Spaniards and might have acted as if he did partly for motives of sheer fright. It might even be worthwhile considering what might have occurred if the situation had been reversed and Spain had been subjected at that time to an invasion by totally unfamiliar beings using unknown weapons. Charles V was undoubtedly brave as well as astute, but one may well wonder as to his state of mind, supposing that a group of 500 men, for all he knew coming from another planet, had landed in northern Europe, equipped with, say, armored cars and machine guns. How would he and his advisors have reacted to the news that this minute but invincible troop had obtained the submission of his subjects in the Netherlands, had totally crushed the, f the French, whom he could defeat but never annihilate, and were now slowly advancing on, Mad on Madrid, sweeping all before them? Contrary to what is sometimes supp supposed, Moctezuma, like Charles V, was practical and shrewd. In his decision to admit the Spaniards to Tenochtitlan, a cool appreciation of the military situation may have carried more weight than superstitious fancy. Already alarmed at the subversion of his important coastal pr provinces, he must have been shattered on learning of the ease with which the Spaniards pulverized the Tlaxcalans, who had successfully withstood the, fl the flower of his own army. 
If Moctezuma had demanded from his general staff a military appreciation as to whether he should admit the invaders to Tenochtitlan or, or fight them outside, surely on practical grounds the advice would have been given to lure them into the capital. The Mexican ruler was possibly less disposed than some of his critics to forget that Indian armies, however large, were no match for the Spanish force face to face. The Tlaxcalans, after all, had not been short of numbers, and absolutely no reason to exist that the Aztecs would have fared any better in a pitched battle outside their capital than had the Tlaxcalans. This was a fact later to be amply demonstrated. Moctezuma himself was aware of the limitations of his armies when pitted against the Spaniards, and if prospects of victory outside the city were poor, once the enemy had entered things might be quite different. They could either be feasted into a state of heedlessness and indifference, or alternatively starved into submission. Later on, some means could surely be found to be rid of them, perhaps with the assistance of, of witchcraft, whose usefulness was never to be altogether discounted or divorced from practical considerations. At this point, Moctezuma had not entirely lost his head, frightened and distraught though he was. In fact, his decision to admit the Spaniards to Tenochtitlan appears correct on purely military grounds. On the other hand, when one considers his submission to Spanish imprisonment, it becomes impossible to argue that Moctezuma acted either rightly or wisely. The story, so often repeated, can be told briefly. The Spaniards in Tenochtitlan were naturally extremely nervous for their safety. They knew that they were now far more vulnerable than when out in the open. They had reached their goal without conquering their enemy. Thenceforth, they could not simply live in a vacuum or admit a kind of stalemate by remaining in the Aztec capital more as guests than victors. Some decisive move had to be made. Cortez himself pondered deeply on how to achieve this. His captains urged him to take drastic action. At this opportune point, events were precipitated by news of the killing of six Spaniards on the coast by subjects of Moctezuma. This gave Cortez his pretext for tackling the Mexican monarch. Cortez and 30 Spaniards, armed to the teeth, now made their way to his palace. The Spaniard explained that Moctezuma could only make good this injury in supposedly ordering an attack on his men by coming quietly to the Spanish quarters, where he would be served and honored as in his own house. After a lengthy discussion, Moctezuma reluctantly consented, even pretending to his own followers that he was going of his own free will for a few days for his own personal amusement. This decision was not taken before Doña Marina had issued a blunt warning that a refusal would cost Moctezuma his life. The part which he played in the moral defeat of Moctezuma was probably very important. Such craven compliance may at first, may at first sight odd, if not utter, utterly mysterious. Again, however, one may usefully draw a reverse parallel. One wonders how Charles V would have faced up to such a group as Cortez's braves had they entered his palace armed with modern weapons and faced him with the alternative of death or abduction. Comments on these strange happenings tend to harp on the suggestion that, Mo that Moctezuma, with a mere nod of the head, could have had his kidnappers killed. Such an assumption is doubtful. As already emphasized, Moctezuma possessed no standing army in the strict sense of the word. Gomara tells us that the ruler had 600 lords and knights in attendance each day to guard him. These were, in essence, as in European courts at the time, retainers or attendants, not a permanent bodyguard. Now, the Spaniards had already routed great hordes of Indians in the, in the open field and subsequently were to, were to take the Nochtitlan in street fighting when outnumbered by perhaps 50 to 1. Moreover, when Cortes later went to fight Narbaez on the coast, he felt able to leave Alvarado in the capital with only 80 men. One wonders, therefore, if it had come to a fight, just how Moctezuma's attendants could have proved a, ma a match for Spanish swords. The Spaniards could surely have stormed Moctezuma's palace, just as they later perf performed incredible feats of arms in taking high temples against tremendous odds. At all events, in such a skirmish, Moctezuma would have been the first to die. His actions on this occasion appear, nevertheless, to have been cowardly and misguided. As an absolute monarch, he was probably nonplussed that his divine will should be so blatantly defied. What he did was cast away his throne to save his skin. He could at least try to call the Spanish bluff. They would then have been compelled to give way, 
or more probably to kill the ruler and incur the immediate rage of his subjects as the assassins of a sovereign still respected and feared. Surely anything would have been better than to be peacefully abducted as a listless captive. But only the noblest would rather die than yield, and Moctezuma was at this point too downcast to seek a hero's end. Perhaps even he failed to understand the fateful nature of his surrender. As a consequence, not he but Cortez was from now on the virtual ruler of his empire. The die was now cast, and he was committed beyond recall to the Spanish cause. Moctezuma continued to transact the business of empire from his new quarters as if nothing had happened. However, Cortez was now free to range far and wide, sending expeditions to the distant marches of the empire in search of gold. Moreover, the, mo the monarch's utter subservience was soon made apparent when Cortez even had him shackled while his rebellious captains were burnt in front of his palace. Cortez himself, in a fit of generosity that he could now well afford, unlocked the fetters. After the burning, Cortez went with five of our captains to his quarters, and Cortez himself took off the shackles and spoke so affectionately that Moctezuma's anger quickly passed, for Cortez said that he not only re regarded him as a brother, but as much dearer, and that if he could, he would make him ruler of other countries as time went, went on. Cortez also told him that if he wished to go to his palace, he could. Needless to say, these were only fine words, and both Cortez and his captive understood perfectly well that no intention existed of releasing him. From now on, a peculiar love-hate relationship was to develop between Moctezuma and Cortez and his Spaniards. The situation reached a point where some Spaniards almost came to prefer the ruler, so prodigal with his gifts, to their own commander, whose stinginess gave rise to much resentment where the distribution of gold was concerned. To quote only one example of the conquistador's affection for their prisoner, who had just offered further lavish gifts of gold. When we heard this, we were amazed at the goodness and liberality of Moctezuma, and with great reverence we took off our helmets and expressed our thanks. With words of the greatest affection, Cortez promised that he would write to his, maj his majesty of the magnificence and freedom with which he had given us gold in his royal name. The actual distribution of this munificence, however, caused further complaints among the rank-and-file Spaniards, who received little. Bernal Diaz even writes of trickery on this occasion. As a captive of the Spaniards, Moctezuma's subservience knew no bounds. His nephew, Cacama of Texcoco, who had actually been in favor of admitting the Spaniards to, to Tenochtitlan, became disgusted at the humiliation of his uncle and plotted to overthrow him with the help of loyal elements. Moctezuma himself now betrayed his own nephew, and his henchmen kidnapped Kakama and delivered him into C Cortez's hands, whence he was never to escape alive. The Mexican ruler was now so far committed that he actually formally consented to do homage for his possessions to Charles V. He thus delivered into the hands of the invader his whole realm, without so much as firing an arrow in its defense. The ensuing ceremony was so pitiful that it even made the Spaniards weep. Moctezuma's courage had deserted him, but not his reason. Having chosen the path of non-resistance, he pursued it to its logical conclusion. But he had not altogether given up hope, and his mood still oscillated between the sanguine and the downcast. He hoped, like Mr. Micawber, that something would turn up, and to be sure it did. His intelligence service was still functioning admirably and duly reported the arrival of an expedition of 18 ships, led by Pamphilo de Narbaez, sent by the governor of Cuba to bring the rebellious Cortes to order. Narbaez actually succeeded in sending a message to Moctezuma, telling him that he had come to punish the rebel Spaniards. Moctezuma eventually told Cortes and showed him a picture of these ships. His mood was visibly changed and he almost recovered his spirits. He now blithely told Cortez that he could depart. The latter replied that he would have to take the Mexican monarch with him. Always mindful of his manners, Moctezuma embraced Cortez as he made his farewell, leaving Pedro Alvarado with only eighty Spaniards to guard the ruler and retain the hold on his on his capital on the capital. But before he went away, Cortez had made a major blunder, for which he was to pay very dearly. The Spaniards had been remarkably successful in satisfying their craving for gold, having discovered within their lodgings a vast accumulation of treasure 
which had belonged to Moctezuma's father, Ashayakat. The delicately wrought gold was melted down into bars, while the beautiful feathers and stones were torn off and given to the Tlaxcalans or simply cast away. However, in achieving that other aim so dear to his heart, the conversion of Moctezuma and his subjects, progress was non-existent. He was powerless even to stop the, the human offerings. He was continually pressing Moctezuma not only to put a stop to these sacrifices, but to allow a shrine to the Virgin Mary to be placed in the main temple, one section would be quite sufficient for the purpose. This presupposes a curious arrangement whereby the gentle virgin and Huitzilopochtli, still avid for human sacrifice, would share the same temple. Now, Bernardius tells how, eventually, after warning that such a step would so incense the people as to cause an uprising, Moctezuma yielded, and the virgin was duly installed beside the Aztec gods. But according to nearly every account except that of Bernal Diaz, who does not mention the occurrence, Cortes went much further. Filled with genuine disgust at the practices of the ancient religion, he personally smashed certain idols. We have this firstly on his own authority. I cast from their thrones the principal idols for which they have the most faith and affection. Cortes, by now consumed with anger, sent for another thirty or forty men, saying he was quite ready to fight for his gods against theirs. To prove his point, he took a crowbar and hit the image of Huitzilopochtli between the eyes, knocking off its golden mask. Eventually, the other idols were taken down and handed over to Moctezuma. In their place, two altars were erected, one for the Virgin Mary and one for St. Christopher, simply because a statue of him happened to be a valuable. Other sources confirm these reports and suggest that it was this incident which sparked off the armed conflict. An eyewitness, Andres de Tapia, confirms that Cortes hit the image of Huichilopochtli with a crowbar. After lamenting that God should permit such devils to be honored in Mexico, he told the assembled priests once more of the rewards of, of heaven and the torments of hell and made his request that the virgin should be given accommodation in the temple. The priests laughed as if such a thing were inconceivable and answered. Not only in this city, but in all the land round about they hold for these their gods, and this is the sanctuary of Huitzilopochtli, to whom we belong. And for all the people, their own parents count as nothing in comparison with him. They are ready to perish, and on seeing you come up here, they have taken arms and wished to die for their gods. However worthy the intentions of Cortes, he too at times could act as his own worst enemy, casting aside his accustomed political wisdom and diplomatic skill. His impetuous assault against the hated Mexi Mexican gods just before his own departure from Tenochtitlan created a situation from which there could be no retreat. From henceforth, the religious hierarchy, so powerful in the Aztec state and ever well disposed towards the Spanish at the best of times, became their implacable enemies. The populace, faithful to their deities, supported them. All Moctezuma's hopes of appeasement were dashed, and Cortes's own policy of bloodless conquest lay in ruins. As Moctezuma now declared, his gods were so infuriated that they wished to leave. To prove their point, a drought ensued, and was duly attributed to the Virgin's presence in the great temple. The incident brought to a climax a problem that could no longer be ignored. The spiritual chism dividing Spaniard and Aztec. Religion was the subject over which there could be no compromise. Supple and pliant as he was in other respects, Cortes was not content to temporize, leaving conversion to be imposed after physical conquest was complete. The Aztecs, on the other hand, might yield their gold, their independence, and even their honor, but not their gods. These they would not give up without a struggle. To seek their immediate overthrow made inevitable a war to the finish. What was in effect a holy war was now in the making, but its mode of coming was almost incidental. Notwithstanding inferior numbers, Cortes, backing superior skill with gifts of gold, soon defeated the indolent Narbayas at Sempuala. Moctezuma's short-lived hopes of deliverance were dashed. Far from saving Moctezuma, Narbayas' ill-starred expedition proved a godsend to his captors, whose forces were raised to a total of 1,300 men. But while Cortes himself now tended towards overconfidence, the impetuous Alvarado, 
left to his own dev devices in a hostile city with a mere 80 men, had grown increasingly nervous. It was Cholula all over again. Permission had been given for the celebration of an important religious festival in honor of Huisila Porchli. However, rightly or wrongly, an uprising was feared. Some of Sahagun's native informants must have recalled the, f the fatal day. A great image of the god was fashioned with the dough of amaranth seed and adorned with feathers, gold, and jewels. As the worshippers danced bef before it, the Spaniards entered the, entered the temple courtyard. Then they surrounded those who danced, whereupon they went among the drums. Then they struck the arms of one who beat the drums. They severed both his hands, and afterwards struck his neck, so that his head flew off, falling far away. Then they pierced them all with iron lances, and they struck each with iron swords. Of some they slashed open the back, and then the entrails gushed out. Of some they split the head, they hacked their heads to pieces, their heads were completely cut up. Another native source is equally graphic. The first whom they attacked were the old priests who played the drums and shook the trembles made of gourds. They cut off their hands and heads, and after that, all died. All those who sang and those who watched perished. Certain captains had advised Cortez not to re-enter Tenochtitlan under the prevailing circumstances. He had, however, confidently told his new recruits from Narbaez this force of, of complete domination over Moctezuma. He thus returned, certain that he could control the situation. Moctezuma was, however, by now in quite a different frame of mind. Cortes found the markets closed and supplies cut off. The ruler sent a delegation of two chiefs, to whom the Spaniard gave a cutting reply. You dog, you won't even hold a market or order food for us. War had now begun in earnest, and in the course of a few days the Spaniards lost a total of 30 soldiers killed. Cortes first tried to conciliate the enraged Moctezuma. He then decided that he must evacuate the Nochtitlan. His forces were by now deprived of food and drinking water. The Mexicans, mean, meanwhile, had cast off their renegade monarch and chosen a new Tlatoani, Moctezuma's brother, Cuitlahuac, who had been from the outset the foremost advocate of resistance. He was a gallant prince, but after a reign of 80 days he succumbed to smallpox, now sweeping through Mexico with deadly effect, having been introduced by a negro attached to the army of Narbaez. The wretched Moctezuma made one last desperate attempt to stem the tide of war that he had that he had sacrificed his honor to prevent. He stationed himself behind a battlement and besought his former subjects to lay down their arms, promising that the Spaniards would then depart. What followed is best described by Bernal Diaz. There was such a shower of stones and javelins that Moctezuma was hit by three stones, one on the head, another on the arm, and a third on the leg. For our men who were shielding him neglected to do so for a moment. They begged him to be doctored and to eat something, but he wouldn't. And when we least expected it, they came to say that he was dead. On this somewhat pathetic note ended the life of a great ruler, who at the height of his power was as highly regarded as any of his predecessors. Bernaldia states that Cortez and his men wept for Moctezuma, and that they ceremoniously handed the body over to the Mexicans. On the other hand, Sahagun's informants say that they threw out his remains, adding that when they were cere ceremoniously burnt, they emitted an evil smell. Some sources go so far as to suggest that the Spaniards killed Moctezuma. This is less probable, for they lacked a motive. Having opted for flight, the Spaniards were now faced with an acute problem, how to evacuate their cherished stockpile of bullion. Finally, seven wounded horses were loaded with gold and the rest was left for any man to help himself. To some, the added weight was to prove fatal. The Spaniards had previously captured four out of the eight bridges leading out of the city onto the Tacuba Causeway. On July 10, 1519, almost exactly eight months after their entry, they left secretly at night and reached the first of the uncaptured bridges. They found it unguarded and crossed using a wooden contraption made for the purpose. The alert had now been given, and at the next canal crossing they met with heavy resistance as the Mexicans attacked them from all sides. And when the Spaniards reached Tlatecayoacan, there at the Tolteca Canal, there they fell into what seemed a deep chasm. They filled an abyss, 
Doors of Tlaxcala and Teleoquitepec tumbled in as well as the Spaniards and the horses and some women. With them, the canal was completely filled, full, clear to the banks. But those who came at the very rear emerged and crossed over on men, on bodies. It was now a question of Salve Kiput. The minority who had escaped, including Cortez, pressed onward. There could be no going back to rescue fallen comrades. The Mexicans had scored a magnificent success, but they had not won the war. This was their moment of this was their great moment of opportunity. However, they were more intent upon collecting up the booty, including every kind of Spanish weapon, than in following up the fugitives. Above all, the captured Spaniards had to be lined up for, for sacrifice, and the Spaniards they placed each one apart in rows like white reed shoots or white magui shoots or white maize ears were their bodies, and they removed each of the deer which bore men on their backs, called horses. They now confined themselves to following up Cortez's remnant force at a respectful distance, but the Mexicans har harassed them and followed, shouting war cries. They did not catch up with them, but shouted at them from afar. They only f followed them at a distance. Never had the Mexican inability to fight a total war, on a par with the Spaniards, been more clear clearly illustrated than in their moment of victory. In the first place, it was extraordinary that the enemy could make part of the journey out of the Tenochtitlan without so much as a sentry being posted to detect them. The alarm was finally given, not by a guard, but by a woman drawing water. This was not the way that wars were fought and won in Europe. Secondly, at the very time where they should have been in hot pursuit of the defeated adversary, spoils and sacrifices were paramount in their thoughts. The Spaniards had reached their lowest ebb. The survivors numbered four, only 440, including 12 crossbowmen, 7 musketeers, and 20 horses. Their condition was, de was deplorable, and they were all wounded. They had no guns, muskets, or powder. But even when, but even when reduced to such straits, once allowed to rally, they were invincible in the open field. In the absence of the thunder of the guns, the Indians flinched at the sight of Spanish steel when a battle finally took place at Otumba. Then the Spaniards met the people with sword thrusts. There was a great slaughter of Mexicans and Tlatelolcans. In this contest, Cortez and his tiny group took the offensive once more and charged straight for the point in the Aztec ranks, where their resplendent chief was easily to be distinguished, none other than the incumbent of the office of Woman Snake, with his rich golden armor and huge feathered crest worked with silver. But glamour was no match for grit. Once the leader had fallen, the attack subsided. The, the Mexicans had missed their great chance. When the Tlaxcalans welcomed his weary contingent, Cortez found himself once more on friendly territory. The Tlaxcalans had, of course, awaited the outcome of the recent battle before committing themselves to the victors. It was now finally demonstrated that the divisions in Mexico ran too deep for the inhabitants to make common cause against the invader, even when he was in trouble. Yet more significant for the final outcome was the steady flow of reinforcements which, be which began to reach Cortez. Lured by news of his haul of gold, the first two ships arrived, each carrying a small band of armed men. A third followed shortly after, bringing a further sixty soldiers, yellow with disease. Thereafter, ships would reach Veracruz every month, each with its contingent of fortune seekers. A period of almost nine months, exactly, was now to follow from July 21st, 1520 until April 21st, 1521, before the Spaniards, rested and reinforced, were ready to undertake the final siege of Tenochtitlan, which thus began over two years after Cortes had first landed in Mexico. The intervening time was occupied in mopping up the surrounding countryside and in winning over as many as possible of the Mexicans' remaining allies. Preparations for the siege were initiated, and a beginning was made in constructing the all-important brigantines. A number of battles were fought, in all of which the capacity of an incredibly small number of Spaniards to rout unaccountable hordes of Indians was repeatedly demonstrated. The welcome accorded to Cortez's contingents generally depended on the sentiments of the inhabitants towards the Aztec Empire. In certain places such as Chalco, where the Mexicans had always been hated, they were greeted as friends, and peace was soon made. In other places such as Coyoacan, 
the inhabitants preferred to avoid committing themselves to either side and left their cities deserted. However, the suggestion often repeated that the Aztecs were so hated by all their subjects that they all rose at the first opportunity is inaccurate. A considerable number of places remained loyal to the empire and resisted these Spaniards, as Cortes himself affirms. Detailed accounts survive of how in the final siege certain rulers and their subjects fought gallantly for the defenders. Cuernavaca, for instance, the Spaniards found strongly fortified and only with difficulty could they force an entry. They had previously rested in the famous gardens of Oaxtepec, built by the first Moctezuma. Bernal Diaz describes them as the most beautiful that he had ever seen. To take Xochimilco, they had to fight a hard campaign, and resistance was bitter. The Spaniards burnt and destroyed the city. Of crucial significance was the allegiance of Texcoco. It soon became clear that in seeking to subject the city to his imperious will, Moctezuma had overstrained the loyalty of his erstwhile partner. Whereas others remained true to the Aztec cause, Texcoco, which had formerly aided the Mexicans to conquer such peoples, now declared for the Spaniards. Cacama, the rebellious ruler, had lost his life in the evacuation of Tenochtitlan. His successors sought to make peace with Cortes. However, his overtures were rejected, and he was blamed for the death of certain Spaniards. He fled to Tenochtitlan together with the other loyal Texcocans. Thereafter, Texcoco was ruled by Don, F Don Fernando Ixlizochit, a firm partisan of Cortes. Spanish attitudes and tactics during such numerous expeditions underwent a marked change. In their first place, their leader had learnt his lesson. Now he was apparently ready to afford temporary tolerance to native religious practices. The ritual consumption of prisoners by the Tlaxcalan allies took place almost before the Spaniards' very eyes. On one occasion, a Tlaxcalan chief playfully threw the heart of a spy into the face of a young warrior in Cortez's presence. Even if he could not conceal his distaste of such practices, Cortez had come to see the expediency of condoning them and therefore held his peace. Secondly, now that the Spaniards were in what was often openly hostile country, their actions somewhat naturally went accompanied by a greater sense of by a greater measure of brutality. Partly as a source of funds and partly to provide labor, they took to enslaving the population in places which resisted. The slaves were branded with a G for guerra or war. Some were made to work for their captors, while others were sold at auction. Like the distribution of gold, the allotment of slaves provided a bone of contention among the conquerors. The chosen method gave rise to much grumbling. After Cortes had set aside the royal fifth and his own fifth share, the others complained that there was not one pretty girl left. The best of them had simply disappeared. The female slaves also had their own grievances. If they were auctioned to soldiers who enjoyed a bad reputation for their treatment of their human chattels, they vanished and were never seen ever again. Meanwhile, in Tenochtitlan, warlike preparations, perhaps inadequate in scope, were also underway. In particular, the cutting of the causeways. Following the death of Cuitlahuac, after his reign of 80 days, Cuauhtémoc, son of the great emperor Ahuitzot, was chosen to succeed him. Cuauhtémoc means descending eagle, symbolic of the setting sun. It was Cuitlahuac, rather than the youthful Cuauhtémoc, who had up to this point been the leading exponent of resistance. Cuauhtémoc had actually sought and advised the making of peace. However, once he saw that this was unobtainable, he proved a gallant leader. Following the Spaniards' evacuation, the initial reaction in the city had been that they had gone for good, never to return. Certain dissensions arose in the city, and a few leaders were killed for having collaborated with the enemy. Meanwhile, a terrible smallpox epidemic inflicted its grim toll, carrying off not only the ruler but also many of his subjects. The nine months between the departure of the invader and his return proved an anxious interlude, made the more agonizing by the total inability of the Mexican forces to save the surrounding cities, some only a few miles from the capital, from being absorbed by the once more victorious Spaniards. On April 28, 1521, Cortes was at last ready for the siege. With the reinforcements with which he had received, his force now numbered 86 horsemen, 118 musketeers and crossbowmen, and 700 soldiers armed with swords and shields, together with 15 guns. Nearly 300 of this force was required to man the brigantines. After equipping the brigantines, Cortes divided the number of his force into three roughly equal parts. The first 
under Pedro de, Al de Alvarado, was stationed at the entrance to the Tacuba Causeway in Tenochtitlan. The second, commanded by Cristobal de Olid, was posted in Coyoacan, opposite another causeway. The third, led by Gonzalo de Sandoval, pitched its, its camp near Iztapalapa, which guarded a third point of entry. Each contingent was supported by many thousands of native auxiliaries, many from Tlaxcala and Chalco. This arrangement left the northernmost exit to the mainland open. Very shortly, however, Olid and Sandoval, helped by the brigantines, advanced up their respective causeways and joined forces at the point where these two roads into Tenochtitlan became one. One force thus became re redundant. Sandoval was relieved and sent to tackle the northern causeway, which reached the mainland at Tepeyac, where the Basilica of Guadalupe now stands. The siege was now in its initial stage, during which the attacking force made steady progress, advancing from the causeways into the outskirts of the city. It was a ding-dong battle. The Spaniards would gain canal bridges by day, in which the Mexicans occupied the following night. The attackers filled in the gaps in the causeways, and the defenders promptly reopened them. To counter this impediment, the Spaniards guarded their captured bridges at night, though such watches places, placed an added strain on their small force. In the forefront of the battle were the brigantines, which the Mexicans tried desperately to lure onto strategically placed sticks. They were now being used to waylay food supplies entering the city at night. However, as yet the blockade was not complete, and it must be borne in mind that a number of subject cities remained loyal. At this point, some devolution had taken place, particularly of houses along the Tacuba Causeway, but most of Tenochtitlan still stood intact. The initial phase of the operation, so far successful, ended with a check. Cortez himself, fighting with Olid's contingent, attacking from the south, penetrated far into the city but withdrew again, apparently considering his force insufficient to consolidate such gains. Equally, the canal gaps were not adequately filled in, in spite of the presence of 10,000 allies to assist in this task, for which they were better fitted than for fighting. The ferocity of the attack was matched by the valor of the defense, and a number of Tlatelolcans who had quickly entered the palace, which had been the home of Moctezuma, then emerged in terror and came up against the horsemen. One of them lanced a Tlatelolcan, and though he had speared him, yet he took hold firmly of the iron lance. Then his companions went to, went to tear it from the rider's hands, threw him down up upon his back, and upset him. And when he had f fallen and tumbled to the earth, they hit him repeatedly. They struck him on the back of the head. He died there. Alvarado, operating from Tacuba, now attempted these same forcing tactics and fell into a trap. The Mexicans lured him forward and then opened a yawning gap in the causeway behind the, ad the advancing army. His small force, numbering about 180 men, was set upon from all sides and five men were taken alive. Had it not been for the obsession with the capture of sacrificial victims, probably far greater casualties could have been inf inflicted. Bernal Diaz, on, his, on this occasion, narrowly avoided ending his life on the sacrificial stone. As for myself, many Indians grappled with me, but I got my arm free, and our, and our Lord Jesus Christ gave me strength enough to, to slash with my sword so that I came out of the water safely, though I was badly wounded in one arm. After this Spanish reverse, the second phase, phase of the siege began, which was characterized by altered tactics. Cortez now realized that there was no shortcut to victory and that the city simply could not be taken by a sudden thrust. He had learned that his forces were insufficient to take Tenochtitlan by storm. He could raise it to the ground from the, from the outside, but he could not seize it from within. In almost any European siege operation, once the defenses were breached and the besiegers stormed the, ra the ramparts, the, the day was won. Such a conclusion presuppose an attacking army of comparable strength to the defenders, but in this unique case, a great capital was besieged by a force minute in comparison with the besieged. If they forced their way into the center, leaving behind them districts with buildings still intact, the defenders could simply surround them, bar their exit over the canals, and bombard them from the safety of their rooftops. The Nochtilan could thus could not be breached by such a force. It could only be systematically demolished. This is what now began to happen. From this point on, as the bridges were taken, the surrounding buildings were raised to the ground with the help of native auxiliaries. Um, native auxiliaries. 
The city could thus be taken little by little by steamroller tactics, no buildings being left standing from which to assault the attackers, particularly near the causeways. Once they regained their necessary room to maneuver, the Spaniards were again invincible. Whatever had been their shortcomings in previous encounters, rulers, priests, and people were now united to defend their city to the last. There were many feats of individual bravery. And when the Spaniards came, all was cleared. No man of the common folk appeared. But Zilakatzin, a great chieftain and very brave, then cast three of the stones which he carried, great huge round rocks, wall stones or white stones. One he had in his hand, two he bore upon his shield. Thereupon he gave chase to the Spaniards, dispersing them and scattering them in the in the water. Into the water they went. In truth, heavily laden water, heavily laden on the water were the boats as they went down into them. This valiant warrior further confused the enemy as he tried every as they tried every method to kill him by adopting different dis, dis, disguises. On one occasion, he appeared in his true guise as an Otomi warrior. On another, he would hide his identity himself by putting on a feather headdress and a wig with the headband of two eagle feather tufts. So fierce was the general resistance that the Spaniards made painfully slow progress, notwithstanding the soundness of their new tactics. Cortez accordingly grew impatient and himself fell a prey to the very rashness for, for which he had chided Al Alvarado. He actually pushed forward as far as the great square and sighted a cannon on the stone used for the gladiatorial sacrifice. But once again, a fatal gap had been left in the causeway that led to, s to safety. Well-placed stakes held off the brigantines, while squadrons of warriors and fleets of canoes fell upon the attackers, carrying off 53 soldiers alive. The leader himself narrowly escaped capture. Here is related how once again the Mexicans took captives and seized Spaniards and as counted, the captured Spaniards were 53. And when this had come to pass, then the chieftains who had been crouched together fell upon them. They fell upon from their ambush in the spaces among the houses. And the Spaniards, when they saw this, were as if drunk. Thereupon were captives made. Truly they forced the Spaniards into the water and indeed all the allied people. And after this, they took the captives to Yacacolco. They were urged forward. They, w they went surrounding the captives. One went weeping, one singing one crying war cries while striking the mouth with the palm of the hand. And when they had been brought to Yacacolco, thereupon they were placed in rolls in files. One by one they proceeded to the small pyramid where they were slain. First went the Spaniards. The Mexicans, having routed those attacking from the south, were now rounded upon the Spaniards advancing from the north, who escaped with the loss of six men. Alvarado's Tacuba contingent was also subjected to heavy assault. The Mexicans threw five heads in front of his men, announcing that they had killed Cortez and would soon dispatch the remaining Spaniards. Following this disaster, the besiegers retired to lick their wounds. To their horror, they could actually observe from the distance the sacrifice of their companions, who were driven up the temple steps with plumes on their heads and forced to dance before the image of Huitzilopochtli. Once more, the Mexicans had secured a resounding but ephemeral triumph. It was to be their last. Yet again, the fruits of victory were cast aside. At the moment when the attack might have been pressed home, more urgent matters engaged their attention. The sacrificial offerings and the victory dancing, which continued all night long. Every evening, ceremonies took place in the great temple, which was brilliantly lit with huge fires. But words seemed to have taken precedence over action. They taunted these Spaniards, telling them that within a week, none of them would be left alive. They even com complained. To show how evil you are, even your flesh is bad to eat, for it is as bitter as gall, so bitter we can't swallow it. At this moment, the outcome of the siege possibly lay in the balance. The Spaniards could not afford more losses of this nature. Many native allies, including most of the Tlaxcalans, proved to be fair where their friends and deserted the Spaniards. Most of them left without informing Cortes. One of the faithful who remained was Don Fernando Isli Solchid of Texcoco. By an irony of history, it was an Aztec ruler who explained to Cortes how he could best defeat his own countrymen. Don Fernando told Cortes that hunger and thirst would harm the Mexicans much more than fighting. The siege accordingly entered its third and last place. During the second, the policy of blockade and demolition had duly been put into effect, but had been set aside in a fit of impatience. In the third, these tactics were to be systematically applied. From this moment, the efforts of the brigantines were concentrated 
or concentrated upon the interruption of supplies of food and water to the beleaguered city. The people were forced to eat lizards and even tanned hides. They gnawed sedum and mud bricks. Never had there been such suffering. It was terrifying how they were besieged. Truly in great numbers, they starved. And quite calmly, the enemy hemmed us in and contained us. The leveling, leveling operations started again. And before long, the Spaniards had, had sufficient room to maneuver along the streets because all the houses had been demolished. Moreover, the causeway gaps were now being permanently filled with solid rubble and could not be quickly reopened. A large part of the city was thus laid waste and captured. Cortes now sent to Guatemoc, offering peace. The messengers insisted on bearing a letter. Naturally, the recipients could not read such a communication but it had become an established method of signifying that a Spanish missive was both genuine and important. By this time, the young ruler, who had fought so gallantly, was himself disposed to yield to avoid further suffering and the total dis destruction of the city. He summoned a council and told them that he had done all that he could. Each time that he thought that the Spaniards were beaten, they turned up again stronger than before. The Mexican allies had now finally deserted them. Only the priests, the implacable enemies of the iconoclastic Cortes opposed surrender and preferred to die fighting rather than submit to, to slavery. Their advice prevailed. The Michica now stood alone. It is hard to exaggerate the forlorn courage displayed during this last stand when the chosen of Huizilopochtli, deserted by their friends, remained true to their god and to their traditions. One last hope remained. A famous warrior was arrayed in the Quetzal Feather Owl the device of Guatemoc's father, Awitot. Guatemoc then spoke. This device was the device of my father, Awitotzi. Let him wear it. Let him die in it. May he gain honor before the people. May he become a portent in it. May our foes see him and marvel at him. After this had been done, the second in the land, the woman snake then spoke. O Mexicans, O Tlatelolcans, hath, Mex hath Mexico been nothing? that on which Mexican rule was founded. It is said to be with the power of Huizilopochtli, which he hurled at one. It is none other than the fire serpent, the fire drill, with which he walked, casting it at our foes, which you, O Mexicans, have held as his power of the dart. Fortwith you will aim it against our foes. Equipped with this hollow weapon, armed with which the god had sprung from his mother's womb, the warrior went forth. And when our foes saw him, it was as if a mountain had burst. In truth, all the Spaniards took fright. Much did he terrify them, as if they had seen in him something inhuman. Ala but alas, such a triumph was short-lived. The Mexican resistance was now confined to Tlatelolco, and here Alvarado's forces actually succeeded in reaching the great market square. This was indeed the beginning of the end. Cortes, fighting a mile away, could see flames emerge from the great temple of Tlatelolco. In the last Aztec redoubt, all was anguish. The ways are strewn with broken lances. Hair is scattered on all sides. The houses are without roofs. Their walls are redded. Warm swarm in these streets and squares. And the walls are spattered with brains. The waters are red as if dyed. And when we drink, it is as if we drank liquid saltpeter. At last, Guatemala could hold out no more. Fearful of being surrounded and captured in what remained of his capital, he made a dash for freedom. He did not get far. It pleased our Lord God that Garcia Holguin overtook the canoes and piraguas in which Guatemuz Guatemoc was sailing. From the style of the man and of the awnings and the seat he was using, he knew that it was Guatemoc, the great lord of Mexico, and signaled for them to, to stop. When they didn't, Garcia Hogan pretended that he was going to fire on them with muskets and crossbows. Guatemoc was afraid and shouted, Don't shoot at me. I am the king of this city and they call me Guatemoc. I ask you not to disturb the things I am taking with me or my wife or my relations. Only take me to Malinche quickly. The place where this event occurred can still be visited, though needless to say, no longer by canoe. As one enters the church of La Concepcion, in the square called La Plaza de la Concepcion Tequipeuca. A plaque can be seen on the wall at the right hand side which reads as follows Tequipeuca, the, the place where the slavery commenced. 
Here, the Emperor Guatemotzin was made prisoner in the afternoon of August 13, 1521. Bernal Diaz gives a description of Guatemoc. He had the appearance of a man in quality, both in features and in body. His face was somewhat large and cheerful, with eyes more grave than gay. He was 26 years old, and his complexion was somewhat lighter than that usual to brown Indians. Cortez's initial greeting of his defeated foe was affectionate. When Sandoval and Hogin arrived with, Guat with Guatemoc and brought him before Cortez, he embraced him with great pleasure and showed affection for him and his captains. Then Guatemoc said, Senor Molinche, I have done what I was obliged to do in the defense of my city and my people. I can do no more. I have been brought before you by force as a prisoner. Take that dagger from your belt and kill me with it quickly. Then he wept and sobbed, and the other great lords he had brought with him wept also. So ghastly was the situation in the city that Cortes gave orders that all who were able should leave. But let me tell you about the dead bodies. I swear that all the houses on the lake were full of heads and corpses. I have read of the destruction of Jerusalem, but I cannot believe that the massacre was greater than that of Mexico, although I cannot say for certain. The streets, squares, houses, and courts were filled with bodies so that it was almost impossible to pass. Even Cortes was sick from the stink in the nostrils. The conquerors, who had themselves lived on meager rations during the siege, could see how their adversary had suffered. The whole city had been dug up for roots, which they had cooked and eaten. They even stripped the, b the bark from some of the trees and eaten it. We found no fresh water, only salt. Meanwhile, the Tlaxcalan allies were permitted to exact a cruel vengeance. Cortes himself remarks in his third letter to Charles V that they dined particularly well that, that night on the limbs of the vanquished. Equally to be lamented, the, the Tlaxcalan sacked Texcoco, burning places and libraries. For this, they drew anguished protests from Don Fernando de Texcocan ruler, an equally firm ally of the Spaniards. The victors, themselves hungry for gold, were not slow to take advantage of their triumph. And everywhere the Spaniards, the Spaniards were seizing and robbing the people. They sought gold. As they did, as nothing did they value the green stone, Quetzal feathers, and turquoise. The gold was everywhere in the bosoms or in the skirts of the wretched women. And as for the men, it was everywhere in their breech clouts and in their mouths. And the Spaniards seized and set apart the, pr the pretty women those of the light bodies, the fair-skinned ones. And some women, when they were about to be assaulted, covered their faces with mud and put on old, mended rags for their shifts. Cortez himself summoned the leaders. He demanded 200 bars of gold. They told him that most of it had gone to the bottom of the lagoon during the retreat from Tenochtitlan. They were cruelly treated for not satisfying the victors' exactions. Some were even torn apart by dogs. Acting no doubt against his better judgment, under pressure from his gold-hungry veterans, Cortes even gave orders that Guatemoc's feet should be exposed to the fire in order to, ex to extract more gold. The struggle had been ferocious and hard-fought. At times, the very issue hung in the balance. Once in the final siege, and previously when the Spaniards evacuated their capital, the Aztecs had nearly triumphed. On both occasions, true to their innate concepts of war, they had to celebrate victory when they should have been pursuing the enemy, who thus lived to fight another day. Had the intrepid Awitzot still rule, instead of the more volatile Moctezuma, who lost his nerve at the critical moment, it is not impossible that Cortez's force might have been driven back to the coast or even into the sea. Such a victory, however, could have only proved eph ephemeral. It could not have altered the course of history. It might indeed have secured a few years' respite for the stricken empire, but the news of Cortez's Hall of Gold would have proved a magnetic attraction for ever more Spaniards, sufficient in numbers to complete the task. Nor can one suppose that the Aztecs would have profited by a temporary respite to acquire European arms or master European tactics. During the two-year period between Cortez's first landing and the siege of Tenochtitlan, they had not learned anything that could make them a match for the soldiers of Spain. Their resistance, however gallant, was doomed to prove futile in the end. This concludes chapter 8.